In my last video, I took you through the design and free CAD editing steps needed to customize the Puma microscope, and I used a specific example of making Puma compatible with a Celestron XLLX astronomical eyepiece. This ended with the generation of STL mesh files for the new models, but the realization of those new CAD models into physical models was not discussed. In this video, I'll show you how to 3D print, assemble and use those new models. First, I'll give a basic introduction to the type of 3D printing process I'll be using, which is an FDM or Fused Deposition Modeling based additive manufacturing technique whereby a filament of thermoplastic is melted and extruded through a heated nozzle. While this extrusion is happening, the nozzle moves over a print bed surface in a pattern to lay down a thin layer of plastic. The process is continued after raising the nozzle a little to lay down another layer of plastic which fuses to the previous layer before it solidifies. By continuing this process, a model is built up one Z layer at a time. Now, there are many variations on this theme, and there are also different types of 3D printing that do not use this FDM technique. The interested viewer is referred to links in the video description to learn more. The printer I use is called a Creality Ender 3, which is a low-cost open-source hardware printer. Now, I'm not saying this is the best printer to use. Choosing a printer is like choosing a camera. There are many factors to consider, and there is no single best option. But this is the one I've been using for all the Puma projects so far, so it's the one I have the most experience with. There are many subtypes of this Ender 3 series, but I use the original model with a few modifications I made which I can describe in another video. For now, just note that some of the advantages of this printer is its customizability and the fact that it has a heated print bed. The print bed is the surface that the first layer of plastic is extruded onto and allowing the bed to be heated helps keep the model adherent to the bed throughout the printing process to avoid print failure. I use a carborundum coated glass print bed because I find this gives excellent results both in terms of print adhesion and first layer flatness. However, I find that I need to treat these beds in a certain way when they are new because otherwise they tend to be too sticky and this can lead to problems when trying to remove your prints from them afterwards. The details of this treatment and my other 3D printing techniques will need to be the subject of a separate video. Many 3D printers receive their motion instructions in the form of a language called G-code, which directs the position of the nozzle, the temperature of the nozzle and the print bed, the feed rate of the input plastic filament and other functions of the printer. One of the key steps in turning a CAD model into an actual 3D print, therefore, is to convert the shape dictated by the CAD model into G-code that the printer can work with. Because this type of printer puts down one layer of plastic at a time, this conversion process is known as slicing the model, and a slicer program is used to do it. The slicer program I use is called Cura. Cura is a free and open source program that can read a variety of CAD model formats, but the one I tend to use is the STL mesh, which I showed you in my last video. There are many settings you can adjust for a particular slicing operation, and the choice of settings is crucial to making G-code that works well in giving you a good 3D print. To help people who want to print Puma parts, I provide my recommended settings in the form of Cura profiles for various Puma models. These Cura profiles are settings files you can import into Cura that will automatically adjust the required settings for you for a particular model. However, these settings are specific to the Ender 3 printer, so if you are using a different printer, you may need to use different settings. See the Puma GitHub page to download my Cura profiles. If you are brand new to 3D printing, there are some excellent YouTube videos that teach various aspects of how to use 3D printers and slicers, and you should spend some time learning the basics with these before attempting to print Puma parts. I'll put some links in the video description to some example channels to check out. So, to summarize, the general procedure I use for creating a 3D print for a CAD model is to convert the CAD model into an STL mesh file using FreeCAD, load that STL mesh file into Cura, and use Cura to slice that mesh into a G-code file. 
The G-code file is then saved onto a memory card and the memory card goes into the printer which runs the G-code to print the model. Before I move on to the next part of this video, I would ask that if you like these Puma videos, please take a second to support the project by clicking on the big red subscribe button and give the video a thumbs up. If you have social media accounts, also please share these videos on them using the YouTube share button. Ok, now back to the rest of this video. So now I'll show you how to use Cura to slice the actual STL mesh files we made in the previous video on customizing Puma. You can see that I've opened up Cura and I've set it up for my printer, including the type of nozzle and plastic that I'll be using. Now I'm not going to give you a detailed tutorial on the basics of using Cura because that's what those YouTube videos I recommended earlier will do. Just to note that we are using version 4.13.1 and this is on Linux. There is a later version, version 5, but that's quite different and so I'm not using that in this demo. First thing to do is to open up our STL mesh and load it. These are the three STL meshes that are part of the customized model example. I'm only going to show you the monocular tube in detail because the other two follow exactly the same procedure. So we'll click on this, double click or click it and select open and that will load the mesh onto the display area. We are in the prepare mode at this stage because we haven't sliced it yet. So this is our model. I'm manipulating it by dragging the right mouse button, manipulating the view. And the scroll button will bring us closer. If you want to shift the view around, press the shift key on the keyboard and drag with the left mouse button anywhere on the background, but don't select the model itself because if you do that you will get the model manipulation tools and we don't want to manipulate this model. So now we'll set the Cura settings for the slicing and that's dealt with up here. This is the standard Cura profile which comes with Cura, but we don't want to use that. We want to use one of my custom Puma microscope profiles, the one that's called flat. So you select the profile from this area here and we're going to use flats. Now this is a custom profile that you can download from my Puma Microscope GitHub page. If you haven't done that already, go to the GitHub page and select the flats Cura profile and then you can install it by going to this thing here, Manage Profiles. Click on that and it will give you this dialog box and then you select Import and then you select the file you downloaded, in this case flats, and you select open. But I've already done that here, so I'm just going to cancel that. So now we have our flats profile which has set all these settings for us. But there are some modifications which I recommend when printing this model. So I'll show you how to make those modifications to this flats profile. The first thing we're going to do is change the pattern of the top and bottom layers to concentric. And the next thing we're going to do is change the infill pattern from cubic to zigzag. So that shows you how you can customize even custom profiles. So that's done. We don't need any supports, so that's off. And now we simply click the slice button. And after a while, it will calculate the various parameters and show us our sliced model, which we can preview using the preview. And it's done now, so let's preview this model before we save it. So click on preview button. It takes a bit of time to calculate the various slice views. And then you can use this drag control slider bar to slice through to make sure that everything is as you would expect. There's no gaps, for example, or anything that could derail the printing process. We can zoom in and on any individual layer you can use this slide bar to show what the print nozzle will do. OK, but I know that, that that all works. And so now we can save it to a removable drive. I have a removable drive already in the computer. That's why I get this option. If you didn't have your SD card in the computer already, it will say save to disk. And 
So this, you will only get this option if you have a removable drive already in the computer. So click on that to save it. And then that's it. We can take our card now to our printer and print it. Do exactly the same thing for the other models. And now I'll show you the printing process. Now that we have the G-code for our models on our memory card, it's time to print them. This is my 3D printer setup. You can see that I've enclosed the printer in a homemade enclosure. This serves a number of purposes. It allows better control of temperature during printing. It prevents dust settling on the printer mechanical parts and print bed. And it avoids currents of air potentially interfering with the laying down of the molten filament. I also keep the filament spool in an almost airtight enclosure to prevent the filament accumulating moisture and dust. I use PLA or polylactic acid filament for my prints, which is not very sensitive to moisture accumulation, but if you use ABS plastic, that is much more sensitive. I also keep the spool separate to the printer. The traditional setup for an Ender 3 is to have the spool bolted on to the printer frame, but I don't like that because it exaggerates vibrations during printing, and vibrations can cause ripples on the print. For the same reason, to dampen vibrations, I support the printer on these rubber feet. There are various other mods I've made, but, as I said earlier, I'll leave discussing mods for a separate video. So, I've had the printer on and heating the print bed to 70 degrees C for 5 to 10 minutes to ensure that the heat has had a chance to evenly permeate the whole print bed. This helps ensure good adhesion and also minimizes warping of the print bed. I now insert the memory card into this extension socket that dangles out of the enclosure. We can now set the print operation in action via the control panel as shown. So first I'll refresh the software's reading of the card because we've inserted this card just now. Now I navigate to the model I want to print and select it, then confirm I want to print it, and that's done. It will now begin the print process by heating up the extruder nozzle in addition to the print bed. To show you the print in action, I'll place an Optark AF51 camera in the print enclosure and use the Part Capture software to take a picture every 12 seconds for about 960 pictures. I'll then use the free and open source software called FFmpeg to join all those images into a video. And here is that time lapse video showing the print in action. The speed is such that you are seeing 3 hours of printing in about 30 seconds. You can clearly see how the monocular tube is printed layer by layer from the print bed up. When finished, we leave the whole thing to cool down, because when cool, the plastic no longer sticks to the print bed and we can easily remove it. So here are our modified parts, and if we compare them to the originals, you can see the difference in shape and diameter. As with the original models, when the parts come off the printer, you must first remove any supporting structures, such as the adhesin here. Note that I am angling the blade at about 45 degrees as I do this. Once removed, scrape the remaining surfaces to get rid of any stubs of plastic. Brush and scrape all the models to remove any stray plastic threads, etc. Pay particular attention to the seam on the inside of the ocular cap, or the fit of the eyepiece sleeve might be too tight due to this one spot and it could damage the coating on the sleeve of your eyepiece if you don't smooth it out properly. If there are any tiny plastic threads left in the monocular tube, I burn them off with a quick passage of a naked flame. But this must be very quick or you will deform the internal light baffles and apertures. Clean away all soot and any debris from this operation afterwards. Now when it comes to assembling, you put the lock nut on first. This is the top surface and this is the print bed surface. Put it on with the print bed surface first 
and that goes all the way down. Next, thread the ocular cap on all the way down, like this. Then, you should locate the seam on the cap. Here it is, and mark its position. I'm using my thumb to do that. Then unscrew the ocular cap by one full turn until you see the seam come round again. This will set the default ocular cap gap, or OCG, to 2 mm, as you see here. Now fix the cap in place with the lock nut as shown. And that's it. The new tube is now ready to accept the eyepiece, so you insert it like so, and attach the tube to the top of the filter block, like so. Here is the standard Puma, with a 23.2mm microscope ocular, and here is our modified version, with the Celestron XLLX. I can confirm that the image is almost parfocal when you swap these monocular tubes, so this tells us that we got the measurements of the focal plane of the Celestron eyepiece correct to a practical degree of accuracy. If instead I insert this Bresser astronomical eyepiece, it will fit OK, but the image is out of focus, confirming that one size does not fit all when it comes to using astronomical eyepieces with microscopes because of the lack of a standard position for the focal plane of astronomical eyepieces, as I explained in the first video. Fortunately, there is enough adjustment in the ocular cap gap mechanism to compensate for correct use with this Bresser eyepiece. Remember from my last video that if we just focus the microscope stage to fix this problem, then we will get a focused image, but the quality of the image will be suboptimal. So, to properly use an eyepiece with a different focal plane, we need to make any adjustment to the position of the eyepiece relative to the objective, not the position of the stage relative to the objective. In this section, I'll show some images taken with the standard times 10 Optarch eyepiece compared to the Celestron, using the Optarch AF51 eyepiece camera. This camera was designed to give a whole circular field of view with the Optarch times 10 wide field microscope eyepiece, as is shown on the left. By comparison, note the extra wide field of view seen with the Celestron. This has the limitation of not showing the whole field of view but the advantage of using more of the camera chip surface for usable image features. Now here is a picture of a stained histological section of human skin, with a dry times 40 Optarch planachromat objective, using the Optarch eyepiece. And here is the same slide imaged with the Celestron eyepiece. The Celestron eyepiece shows reasonably good planarity and colour correction across the field. Note that the Celestron samples slightly less of the field of view compared to the Optarch, about 19mm field for the Celestron compared to the full 20mm field for the Optarch eyepiece. But the Celestron magnifies that slightly smaller field by a larger magnification factor, about 1.43 times more magnification than the Optarch eyepiece. Thus, in microscopy terminology, the Celestron is a times 14.3 eyepiece with a field number of 19, and so would be denoted like this, times 14.3 slash 19. Now that we have the facility to use 1.25 inch astronomical eyepieces, we can make use of some other astronomical optics, such as filters, and in this case, a Barlow lens. This one is a times 4 magnifier. You fit the Barlow in between the objective and the eyepiece as shown, so the Barlow gets inserted first as if it were the eyepiece, then the actual eyepiece is inserted into the Barlow. Now Barlow lenses are not uncommon in microscopy, it's just that microscopists tend to know them as mag changers rather than Barlow lenses, but they are essentially the same thing. Here, for example, is a commercial Leica DMLS microscope with a Leica mag changer turret containing a range of Barlow lenses that can be easily interchanged to give a magnification of up to two times that produced by the objective alone.
Here are some images of mitotic chromosomes taken with a Puma microscope using the Optark x 10 eyepiece. This is from a slide in the commercially available Optark test slide set and is of an HE stained histological thin section of an allium root tip. The picture is taken using an Optark 1.25 numerical aperture oil immersion objective with DIN standard immersion oil. And the objective has times 100 optical magnification. The total optical magnification is therefore times 1000 to an observer looking down the scope by eye. But the scale bar shows the effective magnification in this recorded image. Note that you can just about resolve the gap between sister chromatids in some of the chromosomes, such as in this acrocentric chromosome here. Note also that because this is a thin histological section, you will not see all the chromosomes neatly spread out in full as you would with a cytology or squash preparation. So the chromosomes here are overlapping and many will be only partial, having been sliced during microtomy. And the tissue processing will of course some shrinkage, so they are difficult to make out individually, but this diagram gives an indication of what you are seeing here. And here is the same setup but using the Celestron eyepiece with its 14.3 times magnification, making a total optical magnification of 1430 times. Now here is the same setup, this time using the Celestron eyepiece in conjunction with the Times 4 Barlow, giving a total optical magnification of 5720 times. Despite the increase in optical magnification, we don't actually see more detail. The blurriness in this highly magnified image is due partly to diffraction blur, in addition to some out of focus blur due to the very narrow depth of field of oil immersion optics. Also, I would add here that if you want to image at or above the limit of resolution, this is not the best way to do it. For that, I would prefer to use direct chip projection to a bare chip camera, rather than pass the image through all these lenses. But for the purposes of this comparison, I must use eyepiece projection afocal photography, with all the degradations and aberrations that method produces in passing the image through multiple glass lens elements. For ease of comparison, I have cropped out this small region from all three images and digitally scaled up the lower magnification images to be the same size as the largest optically magnified image. I've also enhanced the images digitally to make features more obvious for this illustration. The one taken with the Optark eyepiece is on the left. The one taken with the Celestron on its own is in the middle, and the one taken with the Celestron and 4 times Barlow is on the right. As you can see, the amount of extra detail seen with extra optical magnification using above objective optics is actually negligible because the primary image from the objective has already reached the traditional Riley limit of optical resolution with this oil immersion setup. Thus, the additional magnification stages just make this already diffraction limited image bigger. This is what is known as empty mag or useless mag amongst microscopists. Although it is not necessarily useless for all purposes, as I might explain in future videos. So I don't like the term useless mag. For one thing, such magnification can make features easier to see by eye during live viewing down the scope, as opposed to image recordings. Now, as far as I know, there are no commercially available microscopes that accept 1.25 inch eyepieces. Yes, you can buy cheap 23.2mm to 1.25 inch mechanical adapters like this one. But I hope this video and the last one has shown you why simply changing the diameter of a tube is not sufficient for proper use of a 1.25 inch astronomical eyepiece in microscopy. So such adapters are of limited use. I hope these videos have also given you an idea of the power and usefulness of Puma being a fully customizable, high-quality biological microscope, and even more so one that is open source and rapidly modifiable with free software and low-cost 3D printing. Please remember to like, comment and share this video to support the open source Puma microscopy project. Thanks for watching.